Thank you, for, thank you for your time, and thank you for accepting me as a guest in your country. Uh, it's not always easy to travel to Pakistan from India, uh, but by the grace of God, we could do it. It's because of our relationship, what India is becoming. Uh, I'm scared of uh, for all my Indian friends, you know, where it's heading right now. For an educated Indian, it must be frightening growing up in India right now. Right. So as you can imagine, uh, I, I wanted also to meet you to talk about three main subjects. The first one, of course, is Afghanistan, uh, because it's, all, it's become a, a concern for you as well. Um, as you know, uh, Pakistan has not recognized the new, the new regime at the moment. Uh, could, you, could you explain me uh, what are the, uh, you know, the, the consideration for Pakistan to recognize the new, the new regime? Why is it not recognized yet? And what are the conditions that you have to recognize the new Taliban regime? Well, firstly, uh, Pakistan wants to uh, take all the regional countries surrounding Afghanistan. So we want to take uh, a step, all of them uh, uh, collectively. It should be uh, Pakistan alone, if it takes a step, it's just uh, too much international pressure on us, uh, you know, and we are really trying to get ourselves on our feet economically. Uh, my government came and the country was bankrupt. We didn't have money to pay our liabilities. Um, so therefore, our main consideration right now is our economy. And our economy can only lift it up if we have uh, a good relationship with the world. Hmm. And therefore, the last thing we want is isolation, uh, you know, by being the only country. But having said that, I believe that the only way forward, if we are looking for the well-being of almost 40 million of our uh, citizens is to sooner or later recognize the government because there is no other alternative right now. There's not even, when the Taliban were in power last time, there was a Northern Alliance where there was a, a conflict going on. There's no conflict now in Afghanistan, which is, by the way, after 40 years, this is the first time the country is conflict-free, apart from, you know, uh, small uh, uh, terrorist organizations which are which the more stability in Afghanistan, the less chance of any of these international terrorists to survive there. So I feel that the only way forward is recognition. Pakistan can't do it alone. I think we, we are consulting all the regional countries. But, uh, you know, for the well-being of the people of Afghanistan, sooner or later they will have to recognize Afghanistan. Now the question is, what are the conditions? Now, as far as, as we, uh, I, I can see from, uh, there's an international consensus that there should be one inclusive government. And number two, um, human rights, specifically female rights, women rights. So um, the Taliban government pledged both. They've talked about human rights and they've talked about inclusive government. Now the question is, what will it take for the world to be satisfied that the, the Taliban meet the condition? Right. This is really the condition because they've agreed to the, the, the two conditions. So for, uh, actually, you, you're talking about women's rights, for example. Uh, when Mr. Mutaki was here in Islamabad for the OIC summit, uh, for example, this issue of women's rights, was it raised with him and what did he say? I mean, as you know, so far so in some provinces, universities are still closed for women. Some schools are also still closed. Uh, did, he, did he give concrete um, word on this issue? Uh, it's, it's not concrete. They agreed to the principle. Right. How they will go about it, you know, if, you, if, if anyone is uh, familiar with the Afghan character, they should realize that they are very, very proud people. And, you know, you, you can't push them. Uh, they hate outside interference. Uh, in, in 2001, Pakistan was one of the three countries that recognized Afghanistan. Yet when Pakistan tried to tell the Taliban, uh, you know, to hand over uh, uh, Osama bin Laden to the Americans, they point blank refused. So there's a limit to, you know, what you, what outside interference or pressure can do to a government, especially, specifically a government which, which is fiercely independent like the Taliban. So it, 
just a caution that if anyone thinks that you know you can force them uh, the force the pace of of what they believe is an inclusive government and human rights well uh, it's not going to happen and we should not expect you know what we expect women rights according to what uh, the uh, people of Afghanistan think and what are Western women rights. There's, there's a big gulf between the two and that's not going to happen. Mm. Western style women's rights, if that is an expectation in Afghanistan will not happen. But you know, they've agreed that uh, girls should be allowed to study. Uh, so that's, you know, there's no, at least that one point they have, uh, they, when they came here, they agreed. Right. They said, we are just taking our time, we, we are uh, seeing the right conditions, but they've agreed to that. Right. As far as the security concerns are, uh, as far as security concerns are, uh, in, you know, I'd like to know a bit more about the security concerns you have coming from Afghanistan. Uh, more precisely, you know that the Tariq Taliban Pakistan has bases in eastern Afghanistan, especially Loya Paktia. Um, there are also the possibility that some Baluch insurgent groups could be also active from Afghanistan. They've carried out a couple of attacks against Pakistan recently. Um, are these m most, some of your most pressing concerns that you have at the moment? Two concerns. Number one is uh, are the refugees. Pakistan already has over three million Afghan refugees. And uh, the, the worry is, if things deteriorate in Afghanistan, if this humanitarian crisis gets worse, uh, then there will be a bigger flow of refugees into the country. Already, we have almost, since, uh, since the fall of Kabul, we have almost 240,000 Afghans who've come into Pakistan. Uh, so, um, so, number one, I mean, you know, the country just cannot take more refugees. We don't have the resources. And secondly, before the fall of Kabul, three groups operated from uh, Afghanistan. Number one was uh, the TTP, Pakistan Taliban. Number two was uh, Baloch uh, terrorists. And number three was ISIL. Okay. So our belief is that the more stable the Afghan government gets, the less chance of these groups to operate from there. Right. So therefore we have, uh, uh, reasons, uh, probably Pakistan has the strongest reason for stability in Afghanistan for these reasons, refugees and uh, uh, terrorism. Right. So it means that when the Afghan Taliban are saying that they will not allow the country to be, ser to be used uh, by for terrorist organization against any other country, do you trust them when they say that? Yes, I, I trust them. Right. I think um, Anyone who has worked, who dealt with the Afghan Taliban, uh, and I'm talking even of uh, in 2000, one thing you can say is that they used to stick to their word. I mean, when they, uh, you, you know, when our truckers or people used to go, after the Taliban took over, when they used to go to Afghanistan, previously, after every 50 miles, there was a, a warlord who, who used to take money. When Taliban came into power, Basically, there was complete uh, security everywhere. And when they guaranteed security, you got it. So we believe that they will, uh, because it's in their interest. They, the, what Taliban would, or government would want most of all is to look after their people. And they can only look after them if there's security and, uh, and trade. Right. So, so I think, yes, uh, you know, as I said, uh, not only our government, all the neighbors believe that stability in Afghanistan is extremely important. Uh, for Central Asian republics, Afghanistan for, from Pakistan uh, and Central Asian point, uh, republics point of view, it connects uh, Pakistan through Af Afghanistan, we get connected to Central Asia, and they get connected to the Indian Ocean where they can take the goods out. So all of us are interested in stability there. Right. So when the UN points out that the Taliban are, still have connections with Al-Qaeda, and other foreign jihadist organization, you think these concerns are not justified? Well, you see, the Taliban will suffer if there's, right. you know, if there's terrorism from Taliban soil, international terrorism, right. then they are going to suffer. So it's in their interest right. uh, to stop the, the international terrorism. Right, okay. Uh, let's talk about France a bit. Well, can you tell me about how do you see uh, the trajectory of the French-Pakistan uh, relation 
for, the, for this year and the years to come? How would you like to um, boost the bilateral relationship? Um, I think um, France is a very important country for Pakistan. Firstly, I mean, Pakistan has half its um, exports, almost half are into the European Union. France is one of the most important countries and a trading partner. So my Pakistan's main interest is to fix our economy, make our country stand on its feet, care about the 220 million Pakistanis. So therefore, my main interest is, is the economy. And because of that, France is extremely important for us. What are your requirements? What are your plan or ideas to strengthen this bilateral relationship? Would you, do you have any particular ideas in mind that you would like to implement? Well, I mean, uh, you know, because of COVID, there was hardly any international travel or communication. Uh, you, you had virtual meetings everywhere. So, but you know, ideally, I would like to um, uh, meet uh, President Macron and discuss uh, our bilateral ties, yes. Do you have, did you, have you been able to plan a phone call with him so far? Yes, I've spoken to President Macron twice. Okay, okay. Uh, so when do you think Pakistan will appoint an ambassador in Paris? I think we are in the process of doing so. Right. Okay. 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 Um, I'll, 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 of course, I would like to talk to you about the, bi the bilateral relation, relation between India and Pakistan, which you've mentioned at the beginning of, of this interview, uh, these big two nuclear powers of South Asia. Uh, would you say, sir, so the, the abrogation of the autonomy of Jammu and Kashmir, uh, was, was completely unexpected for everyone. Uh, would you say that Pakistan's security concerns vis-a-vis -vis India has increased since then? Uh, yes. It was the 5th August uh, 2019 decision of India to change unilaterally the, the status of uh, Kashmir. That, uh, that was the beginning when, um, you know, our, our relationship just, uh, well, there is no relationship since then because this is going against the United Nations Security Council resolution. And um, not just that, it is the way the, B the RSS-led BJP government in India, the way it is, uh, uh, has conducted its policy towards Pakistan and, and specifically towards Kashmir, uh, it is, um, I'm afraid right now, there's a lot of anxiety in our part of the world that mm. uh, we are not dealing with a rational government. We're dealing with an, uh, a government which ideology is based on hate towards Muslims, towards minorities, uh, specifically towards Pakistan. And it's not a rational uh, government where we can uh, talk to them. Right. So you, do, you, do you have still this concern that India has not accepted the creation of Pakistan? No, I think it's, you know, that's, you know, that they have to accept. The, the issue is simply that they are, to resolve our difference, the main difference is Kashmir. That's the main difference. And that's why when I came into power, my first step was to extend hand of friendship to Narendra Modi. And, you know, I know India better than most of Pakistanis. So my idea was that we should have... Uh, a neighborly relationship, and our only difference is Kashmir, right. and to settle that uh, through dialogue. But the response we have got, you know, I, I was quite surprised at the response I got from uh, the Indian Prime Minister. And then Palwama happened, uh, where um, a young Kashmiri boy blows himself up an, an Indian convoy, and they blame us for it. And then they bomb Pakistan. And then, you know, of course, we downed one of their planes and then we returned their pilot just to tell them that we didn't want any escalation. But it was just their attitude, the attitude of this uh, Modi government. So there is no relationship right now. And at the moment, what should I say? There's just a stalemate. So what, what do you think can be done? What, how, how, can, how, can, how can Pakistan build friendly relations with India? What, is there a first step or anything you, you Pakistan could do to improve this? Yes, uh, we can build a relationship with India, but it has to start 
from them going back to uh, that step they took on 5th August 2019. They have to, you know, restore the status of Kashmir because that's a violation of international law. Right. This is the only condition you have. Yes, go back to 5th August 2019. Right. And yes, we can talk after that. Otherwise, there will be no negotiation, no behind the door kind of secret negotiation to, to try to do something. It is the biggest aggressive. betrayal to negotiate would be betrayal of people of Kashmir who've suffered so much. 100,000 Kashmiris have died so far in what, is, what was their right uh, guaranteed by the international community through the United Nations Security Council resolution mm. that they were, would uh, be allowed to decide their own destiny through a plebiscite. And so, you know, denying them that and then using force uh, 800,000 troops which have basically uh, kept the people of Kashmir in an open prison. There's no way we can uh, move forward until they, uh, they restore that status. And indeed, actually, it's very interesting because very regularly I, I receive the press release from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs that condemns the use of force and torture in Kashmir. It's very... And, but let me ask you something that I have, I have in mind. Uh, Pakistan regularly denounces this, and I completely understand. On the other hand, it doesn't talk about the repression of, of, of the Muslims in Xinjiang. So my question is, do you think that maybe this lack of consistency could also dense the credibility of the accusation that Pakistan has on India, on what India is doing in Kashmir? Well, let's just first see. The status of Xinjiang is that it is part of China. It's not a dispute. It's recognized as part of China. The state of, of Kashmir is that this was in 1948 accepted by the international community that it was a disputed territory between Pakistan and India. So number one, the status of Kashmir. Number two, the people of Kashmir were guaranteed that they would, and accepted by India, that through a plebiscite, they would decide whether they wanted to go to Pakistan or India. That plebiscite never took place. Kashmir had a special status in the Indian constitution. Hmm. Unilaterally, 2019, India removed that, that status. So firstly, it is a completely different. It's between Pakistan and India. It's a disputed land. Right. That's why Pakistan speaks about people of Kashmir, because one third of Kashmir is in Pakistan. Hmm. And there are a lot of Kashmiri refugees who've, from Indian side who've, who are living in Pakistan. So therefore, it is direct concern to Pakistan. Okay. So what happens to Muslims all over the world? They, you know, I mean, just from Syria to Libya to Somalia, Iraq. I mean, Muslims are going through a lot right now. But my specific concern right now is Kashmir as a disputed territory between Pakistan and India. Right. Okay. Um, so let's let's finish with the. the subject of the cooperation between the United States and Pakistan. Um, you've, you've been criticizing a lot the U.S.-Pakistan uh, partnership after 2001. Uh, after the U.S. withdrew from Afghanistan, there was this over-horizon, over-the-horizon policy which was announced. Uh, how do you see Pakistan's participation in this over-the-horizon strategy envisioned by President Biden? Does it, does it appeal to you? Um, and have you seen some concrete uh, response from, from you or from the U.S. on this? What, what can be done exactly? No, first, just let, let me just be clear. Pakistan has very good relationship with the U.S. I mean, we've always had good relationship with the U.S. There were aspects of the relationship which I have always criticized. And the main uh, aspect which I criticized was this war on terror and in Afghanistan. I never thought there would be a military solution in Afghanistan for a start, there was no clear idea what they had come to do in Afghanistan. Was it nation building? Was it women's rights? Was it human rights? What were they doing there or bringing in democracy? So because there were never clear aims, no one knew what they were doing in Afghanistan. I don't think the Americans knew what they were doing there. So what was victory in Afghanistan? No one knew that. So I criticized the, the Afghanistan adventure throughout saying there was no military solution, whatever they're trying to achieve. Secondly, Pakistan's participation in the U.S. war on terror. I did not want Pakistan to participate in it, only for one reason. In the 80s, Pakistan had helped the U.S. and fight the Soviets 
in Afghanistan, hmm. arming the Mujahideen hmm. and calling jihad uh, was, uh, they, the jihadis were heroes because they were fighting foreign occupation against the Soviets. We trained them along with CIA. Come, 10 years later, 89, the Soviets leave. And then come 2001, the US arrives in Afghanistan. Now we are trying to tell the same people who had been trained to fight foreign occupation, now we are telling them that fighting the US occupation is terrorism. So they turned against us. Okay. My point was we should have stayed neutral. So the Pakistani Taliban turned against us because all the operations against the Soviets took place from the tribal areas, adjoining districts to, uh, uh, to Afghanistan. They became Pakistan Taliban who turned against us. And secondly, the old Mujahideen groups, they turned against us like Al-Qaeda. So Pakistan lost 80,000 people. Hmm. I mean, which ally of the US lost so many people? And yet Pakistan got blamed for the failure in Afghanistan. So I disagreed with that. But apart from that, right now we have shared aim with the US. We want uh, no terrorism from Afghanistan. We, we are against international ter terrorism. So is the US. So we have a shared interest. And, um, and I hope that US also realizes that uh, you know, they originally came to Afghanistan to fight international terrorism, Al-Qaeda. And now if it goes into chaos, you could end up the same position again. So therefore, we have a shared interest for stability in, in Afghanistan. Okay, so does that mean that Pakistan will participate in this over the horizon policy strategy? It can only happen with the permission of the Taliban government. And if, if they allow it, then it can happen. But otherwise, last thing we want is another conflict with this now Afghan government. After having lost 80,000 people now, mm -hmm. Pakistan cannot afford another conflict. So we will be partners in peace with the US, but not in conflict. Okay. Let me ask you a bit of a personal question, but you know, when I was living in Pakistan at the end of the 2009, 2013, Secretary of State Hillary Clinton came to Pakistan for a visit and she was asked by a student in Lahore that you know, you, you Americans, you, you abandoned us after, after 89. What are the guarantees that we have that you will not abandon us again? Uh, now, the United States have, has, have shifted their priorities away from this region. Do you feel that you've been betrayed again? Uh, frankly, I don't blame the United States. I blame our own leadership. The job of the leadership of this country is to protect the interest of its own people. Hmm. It's not the job of United States to protect the interest of Pakistani people. Right. So why did Pakistan allow itself to be used? Clearly, in, uh, we became part of the US uh, war against the Soviets through Afghanistan you know, in the 80s. But once uh, th that was over, uh, a year later, sanctions were slapped on Pakistan. So Pakistan should have learned then. That's why I opposed uh, you know, Pakistan joining the US war on terror after 2001, because number one, we had trained these mujahideen to fight foreign occupation. Now, how were we going to stop them? Uh, and when we joined them, they turned against us. But secondly, uh, we felt used after uh, when we were in 91, these uh, pressless sanctions were imposed on Pakistan. After Pakistan was neighboring, uh, we, were, we, were, we had four million of armed refugees. We had Kleshnikovs in us first time. Uh, we had sectarian militant groups left in Pakistan, fallout of the uh, Afghan jihad in the 80s. So now, by joining them, uh, I opposed it. I thought we should stay neutral. But I still remember George Bush's statement saying that we will not abandon Pakistan again. Yeah. And they did. OK. Uh, last question. Uh, is, do, you, do, you, I mean, do you have any plan to visit France? Is there any official visit for France which could be in the pipeline anytime soon? Or is it something that you could do? Not yet, but uh, yes, of course, I would like to visit France. Right. After, after Prime Minister Gilani in 2011, it was, it's been 11 years since the mm. Pakistani Prime Minister has visited France, but I hope it will happen. Uh, thank uh, you so much for your time, Mr. Mr. Prime Minister.